Okay, the door is open now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, Moreno. I mean, like, uh, I I think at first I will um I will only put up the the recorder session of Michael session, so I will mm -hmm. not put yours first. So you can tell okay. me if you want me to put up or you can just yeah. No, it's no, up to I you. can uh, uh, stop video if you want. That's fine. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, sure. Yeah. You you have the control, but. Oh no 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 no! I I mean like for for the recorded talk. That's that's what I meant. I don't mean like your your video now. Okay. Oh, you can you can record. Then I probably ask the collaborator if we. Uh, okay. Better good. to make it, to make it public or not. Okay. Let's okay. Yeah. Share yeah. with collaborators. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's yeah. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Sorry. I I I was I was not very clear in what I say. <laughs> Okay, so if we can decide tomorrow, I, I whatever will speak with. Uh, yeah, you normally know, there is some data on, on on yeah, it's a paper that we are preparing basically. Mm -hmm. But um, tomorrow I speak with Hannah that also inside the, sure. the, that work, and so mm -hmm. I can tell you later. Okay. okay, okay, that's good. Okay. Yep. But of, of during the Michael talk i can uh, stop my video probably it's better <laughs> don't, don't don't try and compete you in the background just like doing mine <laughs> <Not things. otherwise. laughs> yeah. you are already recording i'm guessing So how's your 1.2 running? Uh, fine, the instrument fine. The cryo probe, not so good. So we are room temperature probe. The solid probe, not yet arrived. So I'm unhappy about that. <laughs> well, you, should just get the, you should get the magic angle probe and just, uh, just you know, if the cryo probe isn't working, it's a good time to, to do magic angle. I mean, I think they've done quite a lot of of course, in Zurich, they've done quite a lot of um, magic angle spinning already, mm -hmm. and also in in Göttingen. Yeah, yeah, I think. But um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, this has been hard uh, the, since the beginning. So we have not yet, after one year, we have not yet uh, the. Uh, a, a solid probe work no, no, on this instrument. We have just a cryo probe and a room temperature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That um, is uh, unfortunately, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, the instrument is, is okay. So it's stable, reasonably stable. Is it drifting? Uh, still, yes. So I don't know the value now, but uh, this drift was a very strong. Uh, up to six, eight months after charging. Mm -hmm. It was still very strong. If I remember well, six months later was still going up. So oh, really? The initial part it is going up and then it's going down. So, mm. uh, yeah, there was a, a little problem in that sense because um, they were charging the magnet exactly when this COVID pandemic has started. Mm -hmm. And so we organized in order to keep them working here. So we organized for them to help in any way because uh, they were uh, alone speaking German in Italy with a supermarket uh, opening only a few times, uh, no restaurants. Uh, no breakfast at the hotel, <laughs> so several problems uh, they were solved. But um, a given, they uh, were planning uh, a very smooth charge. So they arrived uh, very reasonably rapidly up to 1,100. And then the last 100 is done with a very, very small, uh, smooth uh, procedure in order to reduce this um, then uh, they, uh, at the end, uh, they accelerate this procedure in order to uh, make these people going back to Germany. And, um, uh, 
and also because they realized that uh, the drift uh, in the instrument could be for solution compensated by lock. The, so they, um, at a given point, they uh, reduced the, 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 the protocol, you know, the tool. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we were expected to arrive on field basically one month later, uh, yeah. what we effective, mm -hmm. we effective um, mm -hmm. add. Uh, also considering that uh, at the begin uh, we use the since begin uh, but at the begin we couldn't use uh, so uh, so strongly as we wanted because only few projects were admitted to work in the laboratory the one the laboratory was closed so yeah. mm -hmm. in the first uh, in the first month uh, was used not much effectively and uh, Mm. And for solution, uh, in any case, uh, when uh, they left, uh, they told us, yes, for solution, uh, you can uh, use because lock is, uh, is compensated. Maybe you have to just to um, make sharper the lines. But okay, so Kong, it's 10, it's 11.05. So uh, yeah, yeah. And also like, because like, um, Michael Martini has not shown that. So I just recruited Natalie. <laughs> Natalie, would you mind like? monitoring the session like the q a yep that's fine okay cool okay so Colin, go ahead right. it, it, yeah uh i mean like uh I, I actually i don't have much to say because like, i mean bob asked me to do the introduction <laughs> because i've been doing this like almost every time and this time has been going on for 13 months now so <laughs> it's already been more than one year so i'm, I'm not going to say anything new except like for except uh, it's the same thing um sign up for the mailing list uh, and also check the, uh, the, the past recordings, which uh, I put out everything on our website. You can find all the information on the website. So, and also, um, also if, if, you are, if you're interested to give a talk, just, just write to Bob and I, and then, yeah, uh, we have, currently we have speakers scheduled until like July, July-ish. <laughs> and we are not sure like how long it will go on. Perhaps like if everyone is safe to travel again, we might, we might perhaps like stop it or make it less frequent, but at least at this stage we will still go on for a couple of months. Yeah. So probably, yeah. probably through the summer. Yeah, probably through the summer exactly. Until the hyper hyperpolarization twenty one meeting occurs in August at least. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so today today we have two really interesting talks. Um, one of them is <clears throat> uh, by Michael Hope, who's at the EPFL in Lausanne. And he's going to tell us about how to make a 017 laser razor uh, using DNP. And the second talk will be by Marino Lilly. And he's going to cover the recherche aspects of Overhauser effects with D BDPA and mixed by radicals later on. Okay, so Michael, the floor is yours, the virtual floor. Hey, uh, thank you very much. So today, as I mentioned, I'm going to be telling you about uh, oxygen DMP in Catalonia and Vote Syria, including the, the razor effect. So I probably don't need to tell this audience about the importance of oxygen NMR and sort of all the information we can get at it on structure and dynamics of oxide materials. Uh, but I was wondering sort of how many materials we're we talking about here. So I did a quick search on the materials project, and there's actually more materials that contain oxygen, more oxide than all other materials put together. Uh, so I'm not sure if this is actually true or not. I mean, this is maybe sort of an arbitrary uh, distinction, but um, it's just depending on what's in the materials project, but it just goes to show the wealth of, uh, of structural diversity in oxide materials, and therefore, you know, the importance of oxygen and MR in terms of uh, the characterization of these materials. Now, we all know the downside, which is the low sensitivity that arises from low natural abundance. But uh, we can overcome this problem, and so the standard technique remains isotopic enrichment, uh, but people have uh, also showed how you can use DNP, so dynamic nuclear polarization, in natural abundance samples. Um, but if you're looking at really challenging systems, either one of these techniques isn't enough. And so um, I'm going to show an example here where we need both, um, and there, there have been previous examples as well. Now, um, at the moment, the most common way DNP is applied is by adding organic radicals um, and then using proton spin diffusion to relay into the, the bulk of materials. Um, but this is a problem if you're looking at inorganic materials, if they don't contain protons. And so it can be challenging to apply DNP in these systems. And this is something we've been interested um, here at EPFL. 
And so Stateless has actually already talked in this, um, this webinar about how you can use spin diffusion on other nuclei, uh, so lithium, phosphorus, tin, that sort of thing, and how Relay can work in these systems. Um, but I don't want to uh, talk about that today. Instead, I'm going to talk about endogenous DMP, where you use radicals that are already present within the material. So this could be uh, the conduction electrons in a metal. This could be radical defects. What we're going to talk about today is high spin metal ion dopants, such as manganese iron, or in this case, gadolinium. And in recent years, this is something that's really been pushed by the group of Mahalisks. Um, there's a selection of the papers that just show how, how successful this technique can be applied. Um, today, I want to add sort of something to that, to that literature as well and, and mention how relay can be important um, in endogenous DMP as well. Okay, so what about gadolinium Syria? Um, this is an important material in its own right. Syria is an important catalyst, um, and when doped with trivalent metal ions, it's one of the best oxide ion conductors in the intermediate temperature regime. So it finds application, for instance, in fuel cells. But as uh, sort of NMR spectroscopists and, and PPR spectroscopists, we're interested in gadolinium because it's a high spin metal ion. Um, it's a spin of seven halves. That means it has a long um, T1E, so it has no angular momentum, you can see that the, the T1 is a few orders of magnitude higher than any of the other lanthanides. And so this is, this is a good thing for DMP. Um, but the flip side is because of this large spin, it suffers from large zero field splitting in non cubic environments. And so that can result in broad EPR lines that's bad for DMP. Now, I should just mention that obviously I'm not the, the first person to think of using gadolinium. Um, there's been a lot of work at, at gadolinium complexes by, by Bob and, and Bjorn. And, also some work from, uh, from the group here in Gabrielli. But uh, what's interesting about Syria is the metal site is cubic. And so that means that we have no second rank zero field splitting and that should give us narrow EPR lines. This could be uh, quite an interesting system to look at. Um, and because we have a long oxygen T1, we should be able to build up significant polarization. So this is one of the, the reasons we we're interested in the system. Okay, so let's look at, look at a spectrum. Um, this is, 0.01% gadolinium doped syria. It's about 4.2 millimolar of gadolinium. It's oxygen enriched on at 100 Kelvin on our uh, 9.4 Tesla system. This is the, the microwave off spectrum. Um, and then if we turn the microwaves on, we get the, the DNP moments. We get this, this huge enhancement. Um, and in fact, if you zoom out, you can barely see the, the off spectrum in comparison. Um, and we can see the, the enhancement uh, by peak intensity is over 500 and by area it's 650. Now, um, this doesn't mean that we've broken the, the theoretical limit of, uh, of DNP. Of course, we should remember this is oxygen, uh, which has a lower geomatic ratio than protons. And so if we sort of rescale this, this would be equivalent of around 90 for protons. Um, but this is, uh, as far as I know, the, the highest solid effect um, uh, enhancement um, of an endogenous system, um, at least a high field, um, and is the, the highest for gadolinium as well, as, as far as I'm aware. And so um, this really does work very well in gadolinium dose Syria. And just a quick mention on why the, the peak enhancement is lower. Uh, that's actually because our, our microwave on spectrum is broader. And it's broader because the magnetization is so large that it induces radiation damping. And so it broadens the signal and so it reduces the peak enhancement and, and the aerial enhancement is maybe a better measure of the magnetization. Okay, so we've, we've got this huge enhancement, um, which is great, but what are we gonna do with it? Um, so I'm gonna give, show you a few examples uh, of, what, of what we were able to do. And one of them, which was a bit unexpected, was this spectrum. So this is the exactly the same sample, but this auction spectrum is only two millihertz wide. So this is really a, a phenomenal resolution in the solid state. Uh, and so how, how do you get a spectrum like this? And so this all, this all happened when I was actually just trying to measure the DNP of the sample. Um, and I tuned the, uh, the, the probe and it suddenly started um, going crazy. And I, when I, once I worked out that it wasn't actually crashing, um, this looked to me like it was sort of shooting RF back out at me when I was trying to tune it. Um, so I thought, what if I acquire with no pulses? Um, and so I had to write this very complicated pulse sequence. But um, if you do that, you see without applying any pulses, these bursts of transverse magnetization that follow a very characteristic um, pattern and reach a sort of steady state on the order of minutes. And if we zoom in on the first of these, um, we can see that it's processing and it processes at the Lama frequency. So if you Fourier transform, 
you get a peak at the NMR frequency, 875 ppm for Syria. Um, but because this lasts a second, we get a much sharper signal than for the free induction decay, which lasts milliseconds. Okay, so what's going on here, and as, uh, as Bob mentioned, this is the razor effect. Um, many of you will be familiar with this, but um, for those who aren't, this is sort of analogous to lasers. Um, in, the, in a laser, you require a large population inversion and optical feedback. But in an NMR system, this sort of population inversion is what we would call a large negative polarization, and we can achieve that using the negative load of solid effect. And again, because uh, we get these large peak enhancements, um, we get this large um, population inversion. And then in NMR, the feedback is radiation damping, as I mentioned before. So a recap on radiation damping is effect where large magnetizations are rotated towards plus Z due to coupling with the coil. So if you start with transverse magnetization, this is an additional source of, of broadening, um, as I showed you before. But if you start with a negative magnetization, this actually rotates into the transverse plane um, and spontaneously generates transverse magnetization. So that's exactly what we're seeing here. Uh, radiation damping is at uh, the rate is given by this constant tau rd, um, very of things, but importantly, it's proportional to the, the size of the polarization you, uh, you generate. Uh, and so this is why we need the large polarization of DNP in order to speed this up. And so in order to generate any net transverse magnetization, you need to generate it faster than it decays by T2 star. So we need this radiation damping constant to be less than T2 star. And so this is typically how the razor effect is controlled. You, you control this left-hand side. So either you change the polarization by, for instance, turning the DNP on and off, or you, uh, you can detune the circuit and change the Q factor. But we can also play with the right-hand side. So we know in the solid state that T2 star is typically short, um, but we can make it longer with MAS. And so that allows us to play with this inequality. So that's what I'm showing here. So if we start in a, a very low spinning speed, we don't observe this effect. Um, so we've got uh, microwaves on the whole time. Um, and as soon as we spin up, we see these bursts of magnetization develop. And then when we spin down again, they go away. So we can reversibly switch this using uh, magic angle spinning. Um, and this is what really enables the razor effect in the solid state in the system, which we, we thought was pretty fun. Now, once this is going, in principle, uh, it, it goes on forever. So as long as we're still generating magnetization using uh, using DNP, um, the steady state uh, magnetization continues indefinitely. And so a signal that is indefinite in time, in principle, gives it an arbitrarily sharp signal in frequency. In practice, we're limited by field stability. So in fact, uh, it just happened that this five minute period here was the most stable in the field. Um, and so if we Fourier transform this, uh, then we get a line width of, of two millihertz in the solid state. Okay, so that was a sort of a, a fun project it's involving some sort of interesting physics. Uh, but I wanted to go into a little bit more detail about why we're getting such a, a large enhancement and what's, what's limiting it and, and go really into some more of the, the details. Uh, so one of the things we looked at was the effect of concentration. Um, and this is maybe not, not too surprising, but as you increase the concentration, our enhancement just falls off monotonically. Uh, but we wanted to get a handle on why this was, so we turned to look at the EPR. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is the X-band EPR. I've um, integrated the, the spectrum to give the, the absorption line shape and I've normalized the intensities. Uh, and what we see is we increase the, the concentration of gadolinium, we just broaden our EPR resonance. And so this is predominantly due to uh, electron dipolar coupling because on average our gadolinium ions are closer together. Um, there's also another effect because as we introduce gadolinium, we also introduce char uh, vacancies for charge balancing. This breaks the cubic symmetry, introducing that uh, second rank zero field splitting. And of course, the broader our EBR line, um, the less efficient our DMP due to the uh, limited excitation of our microwaves. And so that really explains why the enhancements go down. But what we notice here is the we still have a quite a significant residual line width of the central transition, uh, even at, at the lowest concentrations. Um, and this is uh, it's quite featured. And so this has a sort of a second order line shape. Um, even though there's no uh, second rank zero field splitting. So I wanted to, to understand what was going on here. Um, and to do that, we fitted the, the whole spectrum or we simulated the whole uh, expand spectrum. So this is uh, showing the derivative on the left and the absorption on the right. 
Unfortunately, uh, these parameters were already determined back in 1967. Um, and so we, we could just look those up. But uh, importantly, there really is no second rank zero field splitting here. This is perfectly cubic, but we do have a large fourth rank um, zero field splitting um, and to a certain extent, a lesser extent, sixth rank. And so this is coupling to a fourth rank um, electrostatic multipole. Um, and what's interesting is that the line with this gives of our central transition is equivalent to if we had a second rank zero field splitting of around 500 to 600 megahertz. So this is still quite a significant residual line width. And this is just something I wanted to highlight that if we're trying to um, make high spin uh, metal ion DMP or gadolinium DMP in particular better and better, it's not enough to get cubic symmetry. We need to really worry about higher order charge multiples, which is not something that was not immediately obvious to me at least. Uh, another thing we looked at was the effect of build-up time. Um, so this I'm showing enhancement as a function of, of build-up time uh, for that same sample. And what we see is it increases. Uh, and this is strong evidence of relay of hyperpolarization um, in the system. Uh, and in particular, relay that's uh, limited by spin diffusion through the bulk um, in the sort of nomenclature of uh, Nathan Prisco in this paper, uh, I recommend checking out. Um, whereas if we compare to a higher concentration where on average our gadoliniums are closer together, we have a much flatter um, enhancement profile um, as a function of build-up time. And so that tells us that in this case, we're actually limited more by transfer across the spin diffusion barrier rather than long, long range diffusion. Um, though there is still relay in this system. Uh, so why, why do we care about there being relay in the system? Um, well, we can, we can see that if we really look at the um, comparison between an enriched sample and a natural abundance sample of the same low concentration. And so what I'm showing here is just the intensity as a function of build-up time now. And we see that for the, uh, the enriched sample, we have a nice mono-exponential build-up. Um, so we have a sort of uniform uh, uh, spin temperature that's equilibrated by spin diffusion. Um, whereas for this uh, natural abundance sample, we have a stretch exponential stretching factor of about 0.7. Um, and this is indicative of a distribution of uh, build-up time constants within the sample uh, and therefore a lack of significant relay. Now, furthermore, the, the time it takes is more than an order of magnitude longer to hyperpolarize this sample. Um, and so not only does enrichment sort of, uh, obviously we've added more oxygen spins and so that's gonna improve our sensitivity. We also hyperpolarize our sample uniformly and much more rapidly uh, which enables um, uh, much improved sensitivity. And so the relay of hyperpolarization here is, is really important in this enriched sample. Of course, we can still look at natural abundance. Uh, so what I'm showing here is um, uh, the same sample and you know, we can get enhancements that are similar to the enriched case. Um, we just have to wait longer. So here it's about an hour or a cycle delay. And that means that if we compare it with uh, a sample with 10 times more gadolinium, Although the enhancements uh, have been about roughly halved, the, the build-up time constant is an order of magnitude faster. And so that actually means that the sensitivity of this sample is higher um, than, than with a lower concentration, even though the enhancements are reduced um, effectively just by a PRE effect. And, and so uh, just to show that if you do have long oxygen, uh, long T1 spending uh, you need to worry about um, the, the, how long your build-up is going to take. Okay, so that was some details on, on the mechanism. And now I want to give you an example of a system where it was really important to um, use gadolinium DMP. And so this is a case of interfaces in oxide thin film heterostructures. Um, we're not oxygen enrichment alone, we just, rich, just wasn't enough. Um, and so this was work I did um, during my PhD with Claire in Cambridge in collaboration with Judith Driscoll. And uh, they grew thin films of um, Syria that form nanopillars within a strontium titanate matrix. So these are epitaxial thin films, and you get uh, pillars of cilia that are about 20 nanometers in diameter. Now, what we were able to show with oxygen enrichment is that as well as the, the cilia signal, the strontium titanate signal, we get an additional signal about halfway in between. And uh, we could assign this to a, a specific interface in the system where we have a single atomic layer of oxygen, which is shared between the strontium titanate and the cilia, it's this intermediate shift. Now we were able to, to gain a lot of information about the system, um, but we're really limited to 1D spectra because 
even with oxygen enrichment, even though they grew four epitaxels in films for us, they still took five days of acquisition. And so we, we could do sort of 1D spectra, but we couldn't uh, really push beyond that. And so enter gadolinium, uh, and they, they grew us some, some new samples with 1% uh, of gadolinium doping. Now, in hindsight, obviously, this is about 100 times higher than, than perhaps would have been optimal, but it was already enough to demonstrate the applicability of this. Um, and so uh, we took this to the DMP system in Lyon, um, the 1.3 millimeter system, because, um, well, partially because it was already packed in 1.3, but we just have very, very little sample mass here. It's, it was you know, center packed within a 1.3, and so we needed uh, um, the additional fill factor. Um, and we also needed the fast MES in order to separate the sidebands. So this is sort of spectrum that we get. Uh, at the top, I'm showing um, basically the same spectrum as before without microwaves. Um, we see that there's a large signal from the zirconia. That's because the zirconia of the rotor is partially enriched. We had to do the enrichment in situ in the rotor. Um, but by tuning to the negative lobe of the solid effect, we can selectively invert all of the signals of interest and not the background from our rotor. And furthermore, we get selective enhancement. So we get an enhancement of about 10 for the gadolinium seria phase, where the gadolinium is more localized, compared to about three for the strontium titanate and intermediate around six, for these interface signals. And so these are in line for what you'd expect with this concentration. But importantly, this spectrum only took two hours instead of several days. Uh, and so this means that we can now do something we couldn't do before. We can get a 2D spectrum. And so this is an oxygen exe. Uh, spectrum. Uh, the zirconia again is, is positive while the, um, the everything else is inverted. Um, we nicely separate our interface signals along the diagonal. But what I really want to highlight is this, which is a cross peak between the gadolinium seria and the interface, um, which demonstrates that the interface is in the same phase. So it sort of uh, proves some of our previous assignments. And it's an example of uh, an oxygen. Uh, uh, oxygen sort of spin diffusion cross peak, which I think is quite unusual and quite interesting to be able to see. Okay, so the final thing I want to tell you about now um, is high temperature DMP. Now, Syria is, is a crystalline rigid solid and it melts at 2400 Celsius. Uh, and so unlike the organic glass forming solvents that we would use in, in our exogenous DMP, uh, which uh, are quite limited in temperature, often cryogenic temperatures. Some of them can work just about up to room temperature in, in certain situations. But um, on, on the other hand, Syria really doesn't have a hard temperature limit, or at least not one that we're likely to hit. And so we measured the enhancement as a function of temperature. And okay, obviously it goes down as we go up in temperature. That's because our T1E becomes shorter. It becomes more challenging to do solid effect DMP. But we can still get an enhancement of 150 at room temperature. And so I showed you on the, the previous example what I can do with an enhancement of 10. Um, and so 150 is really a, a game changer in terms of the sort of uh, experiments you can do and the sort of samples you can look at, um, whether it be limited by sort of low sample mass or whether you're looking at uh, only interfaces. Um, this, this really makes a, a huge difference. But we can do better than this. Uh, and so at, a, at 100, in order to get down to 100 Kelvin, you're limited by how much power you can apply. We will have used about 14 watts in this case. Um, but if you're at higher temperatures, then you can increase the power. So we doubled the power. Um, that meant that our lowest temperature now was more like uh, 125 Kelvin, which has a slightly lower enhancement than um, with 14 watts at 100 Kelvin, um, noting just the slightly different recycle delays here. But um, they more or less cancel out. So this is kind of equivalent in terms of what you can achieve. But at higher temperature, um, when we're not limited by the cooling, we can get significantly higher enhancements. And now we can achieve a factor of 320 at room temperature, which is, again, uh, sort of game changing. Um, and so the, these sort of experiments are, are really important if you want to look at materials in under operational conditions of around room temperature, typically, um, or if you want to look at dynamic processes. But some dynamic processes aren't at room temperature. And in you know, oxide materials, if you're using them as oxide ion conductors, you typically be using them at high temperature. So we wanted to know uh, whether this works at higher temperature. Um, and so we pushed it all the way up to 100 Celsius, um, where we can still get a, an enhancement of 150. And this is really only limited by uh, when my nerve gave out in terms of how high I was willing to heat the probe. But in principle, you could design a probe that that could uh, operate at much higher temperatures if that's what you were interested in. Um, and this 
is something we're quite excited by because we think this opens up a whole whole new range of samples and systems that you can look at and to study dynamics and in situ processes with just uh, radically improved um, enhancement. Okay, so with that, uh, I want to just conclude. Um, so I've shown how we can get uh, really large enhancements in gadolinium doped cereal with endogenous DNP. That's related to the sharp EPR line um, in the cubic environment as well as the long oxygen T1. The enhancements are so high, the polarization is so large, and the lines are so narrow that this actually enables the razor effect um, under MAS. And we can sort of play around with switching this on and off with MAS, uh, and we could get two millihertz line widths. This is kind of fun. Um, we can look at uh, important and challenging samples. So these are thin film samples where we're looking at a buried solid solid interface uh, with selective enhancement, and we can now perform 2D experiments that weren't possible before. And we can also really push the temperature of these experiments so we can get enhancements of 150 uh, 100 Celsius um, or 320 at room temperature. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank Snedis as well as Linden uh, at EPFL. This was work I started uh, during my PhD with Claire, uh, with the help of David Haller. Um, Bowen grew the thin films in the group of uh, Judith McManus Driscoll. Uh, we took those films to Lyon, working with Georges uh, Soran and Anne Lesage. Um, Moreno uh, helped us out with some of the sort of mechanistic questions um, to thank funding. The Razor paper is published. Uh, check it out if, if you like more details. Uh, I hope the rest of it will be published soon. In the meantime, we have to answer questions. Thank you for listening. All right. Thank you, Michael, for your very, very interest, for interesting talk. I mean, it's nice to see that you can get so much enhancement at room temperature, even at room temperature, like 300 something. This is. Um, I'm not sure like this sounds this sounds like something I have ever seen like at this high field. Um, uh, as usual, I will just ask a quick question before uh, so that the audience has some time to type in a question. So if I'm not mistaken, you say that uh, you use like oxygen 17 and risk sample. I mean, I'm just curious, it's like, was it like 70% or 90% label? I mean, what was the percentage? Uh, so we use 70% labeled gas and we use about a one-to-one -one molar ratio. So of sample to gas, we're probably getting around 35%. Um, these are enriched at 1000 Celsius and Syria is a good oxide ion conductor. And so we expect pretty uniform labeling and it's probably around 35%. Mm -hmm. Because I, I thought like if you use 90% that it could speed up the oxygen 17 spin diffusion, then you can- Yeah, so it, it might be interesting to look at a lot of these yeah. um, properties as, as a function of enrichment level. Um, but yeah, that's not, not something we, we did here. So it's okay. yeah, quite it's, enriched. Uh, yeah. I have another quick question. Like, um, uh, how do you ensure that the gadolinium is uniformly distributed in, in your sample? Uh, um, with difficulty um, is the answer. Uh, so um, to briefly give you the synthesis, you, you, you mix about 10 grams of Syria with like a few milligrams of gadolinia. Um, you put it in a planetary ball mill for a few hours. You pelletize it, fire it at 1500 Celsius for two days grind it, pelletize it, fire it again for two days, grind it, pelletize it, enrich it. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, we can then look at the XRD, which is pretty uniform in terms of the lattice parameters. So we're pretty confident that it's, it's reasonably well distributed. And also we can tell from the EPR that it's not, uh, we certainly don't have too, um, too much uh, distribution because otherwise we have like a, a sharp line and a broad line, for instance. But um, yeah, sort of classic solid state synthesis basically. Okay, um, I will now read through the questions that I can find on, on Q&A. So first question from Jeff Reimer. He's curious about the physical origin of the fourth and sixth ramp tensor multipose component. Can you elaborate a little bit more about the, the tensor components? Uh, yeah, so um, fourth rank is a, is a G orbital. Um, so the, the way I sort of visualized this was I, I just Googled what a G orbital looked like um, uh, and uh, basically you, you can see that instead of, uh, you know, just having two axial nodes as four axial nodes. Um, and uh, if you, you imagine uh, Syria, it's, it's, uh, it is a cubic coordination. So you, you have um, oxygens, eight oxygens at the corners of the cube. Um, and that distribution um, of, of, uh, of charge um, gives rise to a fourth rank uh, multipolar distribution of, of charge. Um, 
as well as a sick frank as well. I mean, um, you know, sick frank, you, you, you'd have to go sort of two uh, orders further in, in, um, in the spherical tenses. Um, in order, in order to, to visualize it, but it's, it's, yeah, basically, because we, you, you know, you don't have a uniform distribution of charge, you have charge in specific points, and that has a multipolar component to its charge distribution. Um, I, I hope that answers your question. Hey, uh, yeah, Jeff, if, you, if, if it doesn't answer your question, you can raise your hand and you can ask again, orally, I mean, if it, you, if you want to ask more. But I will go to the next question by Dion. How do the higher order multipolar interactions scale with the field? I mean, like, you know. Yeah, so they scale exactly the same as second rank. So the only difference is the order of the multipole that you're coupling to. Um, the, 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 the scaling, et cetera, is entirely analogous to second rank zero field splitting. And so it, it goes as uh, one over field squared, um, say, same way as, uh, as second rank zero field splitting. And have you simulated so what what Bjorn probably asking is what does the EPR spectrum really look like? At, at uh, so yeah, I mean we have done it looks it looks kind of like this. I mean, if you um uh, I mean you're at nine gigahertz now, right? Yeah, so this is nine gigahertz, and if you kind of ignore the uh, you know these wiggles at the baseline, um, it pretty much has this shape. At 260 gig gigahertz, it's just obviously much narrower, but it's the same same shape. Um, and when I was sort of comparing it with a, a second rank of 500 to, to 600, uh, that comparison I actually made it um, with simulations at 263. So, so in the in the solid effect line shape field profile, do you actually see see a shape? Uh, we don't uh, have that uh, have the resolution to see that. Um, mm -hmm. I do have that in the backup slide? Yeah. Um, so uh, in blue, I'm showing the, the lowest constant concentration. Um, and so we basically see a sharp component and a broad component. And so probably just the, the pointiest bit of the EPR line is what gives rise to the sharp component. And then the broad component um, is what gives us uh, sort of the rest of it, as well as you know, any regions of the sample that are maybe uh, on average closer together, just because you know, they're randomly distributed. So, um, we don't have uh, have the resolution in the field profiles to really map that out. <clears throat> it's not really a very well. You should do this at nine hundred megahertz. Really <laughs> solid effect, right? Yeah. Well, as soon as we work out how to um, to sweep our, our nine hundred megahertz magnet, we'll, uh, we'll get right on that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you have any expectation for a T one E value at three hundred fifty Kelvin? Uh, so, I mean, this is not something we've measured. Um, uh, there's not many people who can measure T1E at 263 gigahertz anyway. Um, uh, only qualitatively, we know that it, it, it is going down. And we obviously, we measured the, the nuclear T1, and that also goes down. And so that's all, all pretty consistent. But no, I, I wouldn't want to put a number on it because it's not something I've measured. Yeah. Uh, and how do you decide to use gadolinium for doping? compared to manganese. Uh, so gadolinium just doped really nicely into Syria. Um, I mean, gadolinium doped Syria is a, um, you know, it's produced on, on the thousand of ton scale for, for um, applications. So um, it, it just dopes in really nicely. Um, probably you, um, you could dope in the other materials. You then have to worry more about their oxidation states, um, whereas gadolinium just sits as three plus and you don't need to worry about it. Um, I guess, uh, and also the fact, you know, one of the reasons why you, you don't use gadolinium is if you have a non-cubic environment, um, you get very large uh, zero field splitting, as I mentioned. And so a, a lot of cases, the reason um, you use the, the other ones is because gadolinium is bad, whereas in this case, because it's cubic, gadolinium is good. Um, so there wasn't any need necessary to consider other dopants. Okay. I mean, I mean, I mean, what you just say, like, also partially answers Brad's question <laughs> because he asked you, like, uh, what, what, what was the key criteria for getting this large enhancement factor? I mean, have you seen this effect on other compounds? That uh, I mean, yeah, it's really, you're, you're always looking at um, two factors, which is how narrow can you make the EPR line and how long can you make the, uh, the nuclear T1? And um, yes, I, I, I Definitely, if you have uh, other rigid lattices, in particular if you have the right um, symmetry, 
um, then you should be able to get large um, large announcements. Uh, you know, um, the group from Mahal has looked at a lot of different uh, materials, or has looked, certainly looked at other materials, um, and you know they've shown that uh, you can apply this in in other cases. Uh, the limitations are generally. Um, you know this the the EPR line width um, and the the T ones, I, I, as Brad says. Yeah. Did, did you mention how how long is the T one of oxygen seventeen? Uh, so I, that's that's really a question of um, what you put into the system, and so um, I have this as well. Um, so you probably couldn't measure the T one of um, pure unenriched Syria, um, because, uh, because of the low, the low oxygen, um, concentration, but that probably has a really long T1. And so by using DMP, uh, a low concentration, we got, um, about 3000 over, over 3000 as the T1. Um, wow. if you have no gallium in there, it's probably longer, like almost certainly longer. Wow. What's interesting is if you have oxygen enriched, um, Syria with no paramagnetic dopants, it's around four or 500. And that's because your, um, your spin diffusion uh, relays uh, um, relaxation from sinks. And so even though you probably have quite a low concentration of sinks, the spin diffusion gives you uh, still a lower T1. Um, so yeah, the answer is it, depend, it depends whether it's enriched, it depends on the concentration of dopants. But, um, you know, cerium is, uh, is, is non-NMR active. It doesn't have any uh, NMR active nuclei. Uh, so in principle, you could get a very, very long T1 of oxygen in Syria. Okay, uh, Jeffrey asked two questions. Like the first one is to avoid radiation damping broadening, you should use small fluid angles. Yeah, so you definitely. Um, you know, it, it wasn't something that we were necessarily expecting to see when we were just trying to measure the enhancement. In hindsight, you could uh, you could just uh, avoid that. Um, the The only reason for sort of using the exact same experiment is in order to be able to compare to other samples. Um, so that was that was the main reason. Um, yeah. And, and the line width you, you can do that. Yeah, and the two millihertz line width that you coded it only depends on how long you want to acquire, right? It's not really by spin physics, but by how how long you decide to. Uh, well, I mean, in, in practice, it's limited by the stability of your field. Um, so I really, what I've measured there is my field stability. So the field stability is two millihertz over five minutes. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to claim that um, this is a, a, we've really got a chemically defined environment to, that's well defined within two millihertz. I mean, obviously this is, you know, uh, this is a spin physics effect that is um, interesting, and maybe it could be applied to improve resolution. But um, it, for, for sure, it's not it's not purely a, a, a effect of the material. Um, the pick to pick with, I think I saw in your field profile, it was yeah, twice, it was, it was uh, two two, two millita uh, four millitesla, which is twice the um, uh, the the Lama frequency of oxygen. Yeah. Okay, and then like another question, like if if the T one of your oxygen seventeen is that long, I delete any PRE agent without microwave. Oh yeah, for sure it will. <laughs> um, yeah, um, obviously also getting a you know five hundred fold uh, enhancement um, with DMP is is better than the PRE alone. But yes, um, PRE is also you know gives you an advantage however it comes. Okay, I think I think that, that's all for the questions. Bob, you have additional questions? If not, then we can. All right. So thank you, Michael, for a really uh, nice presentation. Very interesting new topic for DNB. Uh, the next talk is by Marino Lilly, who is from the group at Florence. Marino, are you going to turn on your video? Or, uh, yes, you go. I'm here. Okay. And <clears throat> Marino has done a lot of very nice work over the years on over on DNP, various types of DNP. Uh, initially, the Overhauser effect, he got into it in a very big way uh, with BDPA. And more recently, he's been concerned with 